We're thinking through this series this week, thinking about how our sufferings connect to Jesus and his sufferings. And I want to start by giving you uh, a scenario, a situation. Maybe you've known a, a situation like this, uh, where you have a friend who uh, wouldn't call themselves a Christian, but as you've spent time with them, talked with them about Jesus, and over the years, the, the conversations have moved from them being quite cynical to a point where uh, they, for themselves, decide to take the plunge and follow Jesus, and, and that's exciting. But here's the thing, almost straight away, it's like they hit a wall. Almost from the moment where they take that decision, there's a tidal wave of hard things that flow. A relationship ends, partly because of that decision to follow Christ. Or it's mixed with other kinds of hardships, maybe ill health or a bereavement or something else. And it seems just well, there's wave and wave of resistance. And your friend comes to you and says, since I became a Christian, my life has gone off the rails. Now, over the years, I can think of a number of situations like that, whether it's international students or friends or people I've got to know through church. And it's almost like becoming a Christian, whilst it might not have caused their life to go disastrously wrong, it certainly didn't make things easier, but harder. Now, how do you cope when that happens? Do you feel broken? Do you cry out, why, Lord? Why has life got harder? That wasn't the deal. How do you respond in situations like that? Well, I want to look through today three things. The normality of suffering the suffering that comes from following Jesus and seeing suffering as a blessing, not a curse. So the first thing to see is suffering is, is normal. And I want us to look at a couple of passages that, that, that mention suffering. And uh, Graham, you can throw the first one up, actually. That we, Edward and I have mentioned in this series, this, this verse already, uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 22. It's significant because it describes the Apostle Paul, who's been on this trip planting churches, and when he turns around and visits all the churches a second time to appoint leaders in all the churches, well, it says this, they return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God they said. Now, I don't know about you, but does the word must trouble you in that verse? Paul, and I assume he said quite a lot more than this, this is just a, like a little summary of this whole discipleship course that he takes people through, is taking these very young Christians through the inevitability of suffering. You must go through hardships. And he doesn't actually divide up suffering for being a Christian and suffering as a part of life. He doesn't, doesn't do that, but he just... He doesn't want these Christians to be surprised. They need a theology of suffering. It's foundational because life is not straightforward, especially for Christians. And you get the same thing after he plants the Thessalonian churches in, and he has three weeks with them because the suffering is so intense. And at the first opportunity, he sends Timothy, and we're told that he, he sends Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one is unsettled by these trials. And by the end of his ministry, his, his view hasn't changed. And he writes to Timothy in, in 2 Ch Timothy chapter 3, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Peter has the same idea in one of his letters. I can't remember if I put this on a slide, Graham, so you might want to uh, forward on and we'll see whether this, this one emerges. Oh, no, you're not. No, no, we're not there yet. You can remove that. Sorry. Let me read this. This is, um, uh, this is from one of Peter's letters. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. There is this call, as we'll see in a moment, to not only share in the victory of Christ, but also an invitation to share in his sufferings. So if you're making your ambition in life to avoid suffering, or your expectation is that Christians should be free of suffering, then I think you're destined to drift a bit through the Christian life as you're flung, tossed around every time some suffering comes along. I was reading some stories of missionaries this week and reminded of, of Evelyn Brand. She was a missionary uh, with her husband. They were called to India. They traveled to a very mountainous region where she and her husband felt a very particular calling to a group of uh, uh, of five mountain valleys, and she spent her inheritance buying the land to become a missionary and, uh, and to make the, the, the base there a home, and they worked for years before they saw one of the village leaders become a Christian. It was hard, and they were often rejected by the community, and after a time, her husband got sick. They'd left their children at boarding school in England, and eventually her husband uh, passed away. The mission society decided to move her away from the mountains to a different region because they didn't think the work in the mountains was strategic enough. But she continued to feel a call back to those 
five valleys time and time again. At age 67, the Mission Society decided it was time for her to retire. Her son, who was a, now a doctor, tried to persuade her to return back to England. She'd broken her back at that stage, her hip, her arm as well. And as the Mission Society uh, thanked her for the work at the event um, that they put on to, to, to sort of celebrate her life and ministry, she announced in a shock announcement of that event that she was finally moving back to the villages that she left in the mountains to carry on her mission work until she was 54 years, until, sorry, until she was 94 years old when she finally died there. Before she died, she told the people close to her, I'm not wonderful. I'm just a poor, old, frail, and weak woman. God has taken hold of me and gives me the strength I need each day. He uses me just because I know that I have no strength of my own. Please tell the people to praise God, not me. In her life, there was no blame, no anger, no resentment, just the expectation that God supplies the strength that is needed because suffering is a normal part of the Christian experience. No heroes just a call to suffering. So secondly, let's look at the second thing that that sort of blurs into, which is the suffering that comes from following Jesus. And I want to look at, at Mark 8, so you'll need to be ready, Graham, to put, to put that back up. If you read through the Gospel of Mark at any point, then you know, probably, that it's in two halves. The first half is all about who is Jesus. The second half is all about well, what was his mission? What's he come to do? And let me read the key verses at the center of the book as part, way gives, uh, or as part one gives way to part two. And uh, this is from verse 29. Jesus asks, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So that's it. That's the big moment Okay, Mark's gospel. Finally, Peter understands who Jesus is. You're the Messiah. But that isn't everything. There's actually a second thing to learn. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus has just healed a man, and he does it in two stages. Very odd. You kind of think, well, is Jesus a bit off his game? Why does it take a two-phase kind of healing? But it's because that's the lesson of Mark chapter 8. There are two stages of faith. Stage one, the man is partially healed, but he kind of sees people, but they look a bit fuzzy. They look like trees wandering around. The first stage on the road to faith is seeing who Jesus is. You are the Messiah. Peter gets it, and you think, now we're running. What's Jesus going to do next? Well, the next thing he does is explain why has the Messiah come. So this is the second slide there, Graham. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. When Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Okay, so you've got Peter, man of great understanding, that you think the penny has finally dropped. Who are you? You are Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. But Jesus says, well, well done, but that's only half the story. Now you need to know that Jesus has come to die. And Peter rebukes him. You've got to love Peter's boldness. You're the Messiah, but you're wrong about your mission. Because <laughs> Messiahs don't die. Messiahs save. They don't suffer. Peter doesn't understand the, me the, mes the message, the mission. He's half healed. He's a stage one Christian, okay, if there was such a thing. And the news gets worse, okay, if you're on to the next slide here, Graham. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the sake and for the gospel will save it. Now, what's going on there? First of all, Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, big thing. Secondly, the Messiah comes to die. And the cost of following that Messiah is to follow in the, in the way of sacrifice and death to self. Take up your cross and follow him. Now, we've got to see at this point, okay, Jesus doesn't ask his disciples to do anything he isn't prepared to do first. He's the suffering Messiah, and his suffering actually achieves something. He's telling Peter, telling the others plainly, as if it, you know, it was not a riddle. He was quite clear about his mission. I've come to die, come to take on the sins of the world, is what Jesus was teaching them, to die in our place, to set us free. But Peter doesn't want to hear. He wants Christ without a cross. We want discipleship without repentance. We want life without suffering. But Peter 
Jesus, Paul, all of them remind us discipleship is costly. It's costly to follow Jesus. There are lots of stage one Christians around. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in suffering. And you know that you've grasped that second stage when you're able to say, yeah, you're the Messiah who comes to die. And you understand what he is calling you into, taking up your cross and following. Now, this phrase is kind of abused, okay? We domesticate that call to take up your cross. And, you know, I've been homeschooling this week. Well, we all have our crosses to bear, you know? And I'm not sure that quite carries the radical sense that Jesus makes. Radical discipleship means being brought into the sufferings of Jesus, not just in his victory, laying down your life for the sake of others. Because this is the dynamic of the kingdom. His life, his mission are not all about power and victory and success. Not in the first instance. His mission is going to look weak and, and a failure at times and like death. And Jesus says, he invites you and me, take up your cross and follow me. He must suffer and his followers suffer too. So if you get the mission of Jesus wrong, you get the discipleship of following Jesus wrong. What does following Jesus look like? It looks like death to self. And that's quite a radical mission in this, in this day and age. Okay, we get really upset. When we look at politics of what's going on in America, here in the UK, we get angry at our politicians, don't we? Because we've, we expect them, I think, to be our saviors. It's really, we actually believe that through force and power, that's where real salvation, real change comes. But here is Jesus saying that the dynamic of his kingdom, the path to radical and total transformation is giving up power, not taking it. It's giving up life, not taking it. It's giving up victory, not taking it. So here's the question at this point for us. Are you a stage one Christian? When Jesus asks you, who do you say I am? You might say, well, Messiah, God, you're my Lord and my Savior. But when Jesus speaks plainly about the path of suffering, do you say, no, Jesus, you're wrong. The Christian life isn't like that. It doesn't involve suffering. It shouldn't include suffering. Someone said recently in our community group, we find it very comforting to think of Jesus associating with our sufferings. We have a bit more of a problem with identifying with him in his. But that's what we're called to. The aim of life is not the avoidance of suffering. If the anthem of our culture is the song Imagine, okay, no heaven above, no hell below, it means we feel this pressure to build heaven for ourselves now. And that means personally, we feel under the same pressure to get rid of any sense of suffering now. I will not tolerate people in my life who make me feel like this. You know, that's the battle cry of Generation Z, isn't it? You won't hurt me. If that's how we're wired, how on earth do we make sense of Jesus who runs headlong into suffering, turns back to us and says, follow me. It'll be worth it. No wonder we struggle to feel a call to overseas mission or we fear inviting people to things or no wonder we feel kind of icky talking to someone about Jesus because deep down we think well Jesus cannot give our culture what it most craves it's going to call this person into suffering not away from it and this is the third thing okay it's kind of countercultural vision you suffer because you're blessed not cursed and I'll get on to what I mean in a moment okay but um actually sorry Graham you can take that down for a second there's a simple illustration okay imagine two buckets one is a bucket full of holes, like a colander. When you put it under the tap, obviously it can never get full. It doesn't matter how much is poured into it. It's, uh, it's only going to drain out the bottom. The other bucket has very few holes. It's quickly filled, and as you add more water, it starts to flow over the side. Okay, Two buckets, holes, very few holes. If you think, by the way, that philosophy is hard, can I tell you, just uh, learn some philosophy, because Plato said every human being is like the first bucket. We crave for life to be full, but the human desire for satisfaction is endless. We always crave more, and that means we can't bear suffering because our fundamental needs are never satisfied. You know, we hate aging because there are unfulfilled dreams that, 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 that we have, and we rage against things like childness because, childlessness because we dreamed of being parents. We're, we're kind of full of these unsatisfied cravings and needs because, Plato said, our desires are limitless. They're like a bucket with holes. Okay, his illustration. And our response to suffering is to try and turn up the taps, to try and fill our lives so much with the rush of blessing and wealth and health and fun and satisfaction that it flows in quicker than the holes at the bottom can take it away. But it never works. It never can. And 2020 was like the taps being turned off. Plato didn't say that. That's... 
And to many people, the call to follow Christ, okay, you read Mark 8, 34, take up your cross and follow me. It's like Jesus drilling some more holes in the bottom of the bucket. It's a burden. It takes me further away from the goal of life, the avoidance of suffering. Maybe that's how you respond to what I'm saying this morning. You think, oh, great, more suffering. Thanks, Jesus. That's uh, just what I need. It's the opposite of what I want. But Jesus only ever calls us to suffer because he first, first satisfies our desires. Those holes at the bottom of the bucket, whilst they might not be completely welded shut, up, he starts the process of bringing satisfaction to our souls. In short, he begins to fill the hunger at the center of our soul. But to see that, we need to change our understanding of blessing. We need to change our understanding of blessing. What is it to be blessed, okay? Let me ask you this. If you see a friend, okay, they're a, they're a Christian, but you haven't seen them for years, okay? And, uh, uh, and, you, and, you, and you see them at something, and you say, how are you? And they say, oh, well, we're just ever so blessed. And then they, what are, what are they going to tell you if that's their response? They're going to tell you about their great job, their really attractive children, their happy, happy, happy life, you know, oh, we're so blessed. Is that it? Is that what blessing is? Matthew 5 verse 11 says this, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted me, they, they persecuted, the pro- sorry, the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, Jesus. Say. The same friend does not say to you, oh, we're so blessed. A few months ago, I lost my job because of an ethical stand I had to take at work, and our kids are battling with all kinds of challenging behaviors. We've got no money to do holidays, and 2020 has been awful. We're so blessed. You know, no one says that, do they? And the problem is because we don't really understand what blessing means. Blessed doesn't actually mean rich, comfortable, some perfect life. It doesn't even just mean happy. It means some combination of ideas that amount to something like full, satisfied, self-contained. In Plato's language, it means the second bucket. The bucket is full. It's not draining away. It means there isn't a stream of emptiness gushing through because we found something, someone who has answered the deepest longings of our hearts and has answered the problem of the human condition. Now, someone who does that for you, who fills you, who brings you to a place of contentment and satisfaction and rest and says to you, now, having given you that, take up your cross and follow me. It's something quite different. It's not follow me and come and die. It's now you're full. You have life. You're overflowing. You're in a position where you can give out. You're so grounded on a baseline of joy that you don't have to fight for every scrap of of little happiness that you can extract in the moment. One of the really hard things about lockdown is, is just feeling perpetually at the end of our resources. Don't you feel like that? Try to do my job. I'm trying quite hard not to go mad. Joe and I are running a part time school in the house that Ofsted really wouldn't approve of. And there's just not a lot of give in the system. And you know, and you, and you start living for little tiny joys. You know, I get to have coffee in half an hour, you know, or, or you know, at least this part of the day was fun, or, you know, there wasn't screaming for half an hour or whatever it is. What helps, though? What helps? is remembering the call to die to self from Jesus comes from someone who is giving us something else, who has given us eternal life. The Apostle Paul gives us another perspective, okay? The Apostle Paul was a man of immense privilege. That's the language we use today. And in Philippians 3, actually, he outlines all of the privileges that he started with in life. And he says in verse 7, though, and you can put this up on the, uh, on the slide, Graham, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. And uh, actually, the, the, the original word is quite a bit stronger than that. We don't uh, kind of politely uh, uh, have it in our, in our version. But I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And we want to say, yeah, I want to know that too. And, says Paul, participation in his sufferings. Who's with me? 
And uh, we all think, no, no, <laughs> for the first part, not the second part. Becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, what is Paul saying? Is he kind of just the weird guy who has a death wish? Is there some kind of, kind of Christian martyrdom syndrome that he's suffering from? I don't think that's it. I don't think he does have a death wish. But he just sees himself as being full. He's blessed. Although his faith meant he'd lost all things, he says, that doesn't matter to him because on the other side, he has gained Christ. And he considers that a particularly good deal. And now suffering along with Christ means that he knows Christ even better. He's sharing fully in the path that Christ has called him to. Now that blows my mind a little bit. When I suffer, thank you, Gray, you can take that off if you want. When I suffer, I'm tempted to wallow and say to God, I got a raw deal out of life. Thanks, Jesus. Paul says, I got a great deal out of life because I can count everything I had, all of my privilege, counted worthless compared to knowing Christ. And now when I suffer, well, if nothing else, do you know what, do you know what I get? I get to know Jesus better in the middle of it. And that also means it's worth it because he is everything to me. So Paul says, when you take stuff away from me, what happens is I'm forced into pressing further into Christ. The more I lose, the more I end up gaining. Because all that happens is as I lose stuff, I get pressed further into Christ. And that's how to deal with suffering. But I think we don't understand this. We're caught in a catch-22 on this. We don't want to give up anything that is too costly. I don't want to give up my privileges of being seen as a, a respectable, rational person. I don't want to give up any degree of comfort. I don't want to have to give over precious time to things. I don't want to have to give up anything that I don't need to. And that prevents us from relying on Christ, which if we, just, if we could just do it, it would help us to see how worthless all those other things really are as the basis for filling the hole at the bottom of the bucket. So Paul is saying, listen, my bucket is full. I have Christ. What else do I want to have to keep hold of? What am I afraid of losing? Nothing. And I'll tell you what, I've lost it all. And it was a good deal. All his gains, his reputation was gone. His home was gone. His powerful position in society was gone. His financial security was gone. But what he gained from it was a deep reliance on Christ. Through it all, he actually knew Jesus better. And now he says, more fool you. Okay, taking away that, that other stuff actually helps me see Jesus all the more clearer. And what he's saying is the more aware you are of what it is that you have already received from God, the more you can bear losing anything else. Because your starting point is not this home or this family or this job or this wealth is a sign that I am blessed by God and I've got to fight to keep it. Because when you know the spiritual blessings that you have in Christ, you're known as his child. His spirit is at work in you. You're called as one of his people. He's commissioned you and he's changing you by the power of his spirit. And you know that none of that can ever be taken away from you. It means you don't need to fight to keep anything. And it actually means you can bear any cost. And through your losing, you find Christ who is everything. After Evelyn Brand died, someone who knew her really well described her as the most alive person that he'd ever met. Why? Because she, as she gave up life, she found it. What cost is Jesus inviting you into today? Not many of us, I think, are called to India. <laughs> but maybe, you know, it's just some different quiet ways that no one else sees it's giving up free time to call people in community group this week who are on the edge and offer them some help or provide childcare or a childcare bubble for a, for a single parent family to help them out during this season or giving up a relationship that's leading you away from Christ or giving up your holiday money to help start us out with this building project that we'll be taking on hopefully in a few weeks' time or giving up a room in your house to offer respite to a family who need it or giving up a Sunday afternoon to go for a walk with someone who's living alone and doesn't get to see anybody. Jesus invites us all to die to self for the sake of him. But as we lose our lives, we gain 
and have already gained true life. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you that you do not invite us into anything that you do not already know. That as the Lord Jesus died, he calls us to follow him to some degree into a life of suffering. And yet, Father, you have provided us, filled us, satisfied us. And we pray for one another right now where we just don't feel like that, where this lockdown has exposed those cracks where actually all our aspirations and hopes have been placed in other things. Father, help us to see what the cost is for us in following Christ. And Father, we pray for each one of us now that you would help us to again be prepared to go again, to not dabble around in the Christian life, to not try and aspire to be a stage one Christian. But Father, to really um, to be obedient to the calling that you've placed on our lives, to be willing to follow you regardless of the cost because we are satisfied in you. Help us to know that to the core of our being to find delight in you in this moment, this time. Amen. Oh,